Okay, this is the first lecture from uh, Gaddis, the Cold War. And I'll tell you a little bit about Gaddis. Gaddis is uh, one of the premier uh, Cold War historians. Uh, he's currently at Yale University at an institute um, where he does uh, Cold War uh, research. He's written a number of books. Uh, this one is written for folks just like you. Uh, it's primarily written for people who did not uh, experience the Cold War and um, he recognizes that for a lot of people the Cold War has uh, no more impact uh, in their historical knowledge than the Peloponnesian War. Uh, this is unfortunate as he sees it because the Cold War is um, continues to shape the world in which we're living today and so understanding the Cold War and what it means uh, is of in, principal importance in understanding the world around us today. So um, this particular book is pitched at um, the undergraduate audience who, or the, the general public audience who don't know a lot about the Cold War. So it's not a book of original research so much as it is a synthesis of uh, various things. So um, this is a book I wouldn't have assigned at the start of the semester because it's a little different than other books we've read. This one, um, this is a book about themes. So the, each chapter is part of a theme of this discussion of the Cold War. So you go through in chronological fashion, but at the end of the chapter, uh, the next chapter picks up, it could pick up in an earlier time. So it's a little bit disjointed in terms of uh, uh, chronology. It's not a strict chrono chronological book. When we were talking about um, reconstruction, we began with uh, the conclusion of the Civil War, and we marched our way through uh, till 1877. This book is going to go forward and then go backward in time, so it's a little bit more um, tricky in terms of uh, uh, thinking about it, but by now you're all solid historians, so I have no qualms about giving you this book. So what Gattis says is this uh, Cold War was fought at different levels, in dissimilar ways, and at multiple levels, for a very long time. So this is a conflict, not just um, a military conflict or a diplomatic conflict. It's a conflict uh, of two different ways of seeing the world uh, and of organizing the world. So it's a, a conflict that encompasses the, the largest things, nuclear weapons, down to the smallest things. Um, the Olympics are shaped and distorted by the Cold War. Everything becomes an arena of competition, which you have two dissimilar uh, ideologies uh, trying to influence others to join them. So this is a book about the themes of the Cold War, not just a strict chronology. And so he says, in order to talk about this, we really need to talk from the beginning about uh, who these two sets of folks are. Uh, and there are some similarities between the United States and the Soviet Union. We are both the products of revolution, right? So our revolution overthrew the British, um, and established our own country. The Soviet Revolution in the early 20th century uh, overthrew the czarist system and, and established the Soviet, a uh, system of uh, collective uh, organization, as it were. So these, they're both the products of revolutions, but the revolutions are quite a bit different. So for the United States, coming out of the United States Revolution or American Revolution, we have this intense distrust of central authority. Um, so much so that the first form of government we created had very little power in the central government, uh, which is why it failed. So the Articles of Confederation were drawn out of this uh, intense dislike of a centralized authority because there was the fear that that would lead to dictatorship. So distrust of central authority is a key theme in, in the United States as a result of the revolution. The United States came out of the revolution in which they privileged freedom, right? So the, the rhetoric of revolution, there's two things. One is, you know, no taxation without representation, which is about property. We discussed that earlier in the course, but there's also uh, give me liberty or give me death, which is uh, placing a high um, value on independent thought and action freedom, right? Uh, the United States also <coughs> viewed its revolution uh, as something that others would copy but not something that we had to export, right? Uh, the mythology of the Puritans is that they were going to establish a shining city on a hill that would serve as an emblem 
that other people would want to copy. But it, as a city on the hill, other people would look at it and copy it. It wasn't something we had to deliver, right? So this um, runs through the ideology, the thinking of the American public uh, and government in the way that Gaddis thinks about it. So uh, coming out of the Second World War, we are thriving. Uh, our industry is huge and producing a uh, tremendous amount of material. Uh, we come out of the war, comparatively speaking, uh, with a low casualty rate. Um, about 300,000 Americans died in the war, uh, a catastrophe uh, for those 300,000 and their friends and family, uh, but uh, a drop in the vast ocean of people who died during World War II, comparatively speaking. Uh, the, also, the United States uh, suffered almost no damage on the mainland, right? So the, the nation itself largely emerged not only unscathed, but as we shall see or have seen, much more powerful. Now let's talk about the Soviet Union. Soviet Union is also the product of a revolution, but their revolution is different. It's a class-based revolution, which privileges this idea that there are uh, unity of uh, peoples because of their economic status, right? So if you are a member of the working class, you may be a member of the working class who's Russian, but your status as working class member is uh, the same as a working class member in Germany or Austria or England or United States. So your economic class uh, was the unifying element for this revolution. So it was a revolution that threw off not only the government, but the entire ruling order, which was seen as um, inevitable, right? So the, the logic of Marxism is that this is a scientific inevitability uh, and the Russians were the first ones to uh, take the steps down the pathway of this. They also come with this, uh, the Russian history in general has a uh, preponderance of um, strong central leaders uh, in their history, and this continued through in, in the revolution. Um, the revolution had a dictator, and he had a particular role. Uh, the way it was portrayed or explained to the people was that this revolution needed someone to protect it because the enemies of the revolution surrounded it. So there was going to be a dictator of the proletariat whose job it was was to protect the revolution. That's a big part of the job, uh, but also uh, to educate the rest of the citizenry because the goal is to arrive at this communist utopia where uh, from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs um, was the slogan, which is this idea that there won't be an ownership class, that the workers will own everything. And so as the workers, they can collectively rule. That is where things are supposed to end up. But in the short term, um, you need a strong dictator to protect the revolution, and that's what the leadership does. First Lenin, and then later, as we shall see, Stalin. Another difference in this revolution uh, that runs through the, the Russian mindset, the Soviet mindset, is that this is an exportable revolution. This is the opening stage of what they anticipate to be a global revolution against capitalism and in the industrial ruling class. So the workers are going to throw off their chains everywhere. So it is incumbent upon the Soviets to help others down this pathway. So it's, it's planned as an exportable revolution. We're going to bring the glory of communist thinking elsewhere. Um, emerging from the war, the Soviet Union is absolutely devastated. It's, I think it's really hard for us to comprehend the differences between uh, the two. Uh, the United States emerges much more powerful from the war. The Soviet Union barely emerged alive as a state. 27 million, give or take, uh, Soviets died during the war. That's 90 times each U.S. death. So they had 90 times the casualties. And this conflict was fought largely uh, on the Eastern Front, was fought largely in the Soviet Union. Uh, the German war machine uh, ran to the gates of Moscow. And as the Soviets retreated, uh, 
Um, they destroyed anything they thought could be used by the enemy, leaving a devastated countryside behind. And then, as the German war machine ground to a halt, the Soviets began to shove it back at enormous cost of blood and treasure. And as they evicted the German invaders from the Soviet Union and then across the states of Eastern Europe, the retreating Germans destroyed everything that the Soviets could use. So what you end up with is a countryside from uh, Berlin to Moscow that is absolutely devastated. So coming out of the war, you have two revolution-based societies with markedly different views and markedly different experiences because of the war. Now, in this post-war period, they have some shared goals. They both want to achieve certain things. Uh, and they both revolve around this idea of security, right? So the cataclysmic Second World War, following relatively closely on the heels of the cataclysmic First World War, um, inculcated a desire in both the Soviets and the United States not to get involved in a World War III. So security is paramount um, in both post-war visions. How can we prevent uh, this from occurring again? how to achieve that security is very different. So the Soviets have a vision of security, and I want to state this very carefully because this is exactly in the order that the Soviet leadership uh, viewed this, or at least one Soviet leader. So, <coughs> excuse me, so first order security for the dictator who ran the Soviet Union, a man by the name of Joseph Stalin, is his own security. His personal security was paramount, and he had done so during the war, he intended to do so after the war, and he had done so before the war, that to ensure his status, he would eliminate uh, anybody who threatened it. So prior to the war, Joseph Stalin killed thousands, hundreds of thousands of his own citizens who he envisioned might some way someday be a threat to his rule. Uh, so his personal security is job one. Job two, the security of the regime, of the communist ruling apparatus, the Politburo, the, the heads of the government, all the people who are part of this uh, ruling system in the Soviet Union, their security become, is number two. Number three, Mother Russia protecting the country itself from any sort of interlopers or damage is also part of this vision of security. So uh, Mother Russia um, is also on the security list. How, do, how can we prevent Mother Russia from being invaded? It has been invaded twice within a generation from Germany through Eastern European states. Uh, this becomes something that is that cannot be allowed to occur again, so they have their own way of achieving it, as we shall see. Fourth, protecting the ideology, security for the ideology of communist revolution, right? So the post-war goals revolve around security, but they're nuanced with the top of the list, Joseph Stalin's security being first. Uh, they also, as a result of this um, conflict and destruction, they're also in intense economic pain. And they are intending to solve some of this pain by punishing the people they blame for it, which is Nazi Germany. So the idea is to loot as much as possible and return it back uh, to Russia as reparations for uh, this war that the Nazis started. So they quite literally disassembled factories and put them on rail cars and took them to uh, the Soviet Union and rebuilt them, right? So taking anything out of, uh, the so out of Germany, this occupied Germany, which I'll put up a couple of maps in a second, um, this occupied Germany is, is going to the goal of restoring the Soviet Union and is, as they see it, uh, justified punishment. Um, it is strange sometimes to, uh, try and see things from the other side. So for a long time, historians had to guess what they thought the Soviets were up to. Uh, I've heard it likened to um, trying to reconstruct the conversation when you can only hear one side of a telephone. 
right? So if you're sitting here while somebody's talking, you can reconstruct it. Um, but what the person on the other end of the line is saying directly, you can't get directly because you can't hear it. So you have to try and fill in the gaps from somebody you're eavesdropping on on the other side of the line. With the fall of uh, uh, the communist system, and it opened up for a period of time, uh, historians got in there and they gathered an enormous amount of uh, evidence uh, and archival material that gave, us, uh, that gave historians insight uh, into how the Soviets saw things. And so uh, one of the things that I would say was kind of a surprise um, but, uh, to historians was that they found that many of the things, there's a, a certain type of rhetoric, a jargon that um, the communist Jews that referred to uh, this idea of capitalists and the, you know how they're always trying to rip each other off and they'll soon come to blows and all this stuff. So for the United States, they just kind of chalked it up to the rhetoric that was important for domestic for consumption, to talk to your citizens. It wasn't something they really thought the leadership believed. Uh, but when they started mucking around in the archives, they came to recognize that Joseph Stalin really believed a lot of those things. So one of the things that Stalin repeatedly remarked upon was that he anticipated with the conclusion of World War II that he had to sit back and wait for the United States and the British uh, to fight over the spoils of Germany. That he anticipated because they were capitalist states and that the only thing they wanted was more money um, that in a struggle over what they could squeeze out of Germany, the, the United States and the British would go to war. Uh, it is harder to, um, to appreciate, I think, how much of a, a misreading this is of the way the world operated after World War II. Uh, leaving aside the practical uh, point that um, the United States and the British uh, the British were still severely damaged from the war and the United States in a practical sense could have done uh, any amount of damage they wanted to Britain. Um, but that's immaterial. The larger issue is there's zero chance that the United States and the British were going to go to war afterwards. It's a complete misunderstanding of the relationship between the United States and the British as a result of this shared conflict. Um, but apparently that's, uh, according to what the archival information tells us, it wasn't just rhetoric for public consumption, it's something that Joseph Stalin believed. Now, the United States has a vision for security as well. And the United States uh, also, um, in a diplomatic sense, carries a burden. Because following World War I, Woodrow Wilson had proposed all these ideas of creating a new security system, a brand new world, um, which the United States had retreated from. It had retreated into isolationism, and um, the negotiated peace treaty in Versailles uh, ended up punishing the Germans, and in the eyes of a lot of United States diplomats, um, that bungled peace at the end of World War I uh, played a large role in the rise of the Nazi state and fascism and the, the coming Second World War. So the United States didn't want that to occur again. So they wanted to be involved, but they were also fearful uh, that the American public would retreat to isolationism because this was not just a government decision uh, with the conclusion of World War I, it was what the American public wanted, as was reflected in their election of congressional officials, senators and House of Representatives who pursued those goals. So there was this fear that the isolationist tradition would come back, right? Um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was the architect of what the post-war vision was going to be, although he died before the conclusion of the war, as you have seen from Victory in the Pacific, but he had a vision of what this post-war uh, security system would hinge on. And he said, in effect, why not have the post-war peace be maintained the same way that we are creating this victory during the war? His vision for post-war security and peace, security that would benefit the United States and everybody else, would be a peace system or a security system that revolved around collective action. Just like collectively the Allies were defeating the Germans, uh, the Soviets, the British, United States, French, um, uh, the Chinese, whoever is involved in this conflict on the side of the Allies, uh, just as they were banding together to defeat 
fascism and the Nazis, uh, so peace could be maintained uh, afterwards. He called it the four policemen. And he said, we're the four policemen on the beat patrolling the global block of um, the world, uh, preventing disorder. And so you have the United States, you have uh, the British, depending on his mood, the French or the Chinese, and then also the Soviet Union. The four biggest cops on the beat would beat the tar out of anybody who got out of line. So because of this collective force, nobody would get out of line, maintaining peace and security. So for the US, security revolves around collective uh, security, which is how uh, they see uh, it would benefit everybody, the Soviet Union and the United States. The Soviets do not have that vision, right? So we need to talk a little bit about <clears throat> what the map looked like after the war. So I'm going to stop the notes and then pick up. Uh, let's go with uh, this one first. Nope, let's not go with that one. We'll talk about that one in a second. Mm -hmm. I want to stop sharing this. Mm -hmm. Let's try again. Let's try this one. Sorry about this. Uh, there it is. Okay, uh, this is a map from 1949, actually. This is when NATO and the Warsaw Pact formed. But this map gives us an idea of uh, what the world looked like in Europe. The red area is the area that's under control of the Soviet Union. The blue area is the area that's controlled by the United States, the British, and the French, uh, or the West, uh, as it's referred to, right? Um, the red area is as far as the Soviet forces marched. Their vision of security revolved around protecting the Soviet Union, which they were going to do by occupying the defeated territories with Soviet soldiers whose mission was to prevent another incursion from Western Europe to destroy uh, the Soviet uh, state, right, or the Russian state. The orange one is Yugoslavia, by the way. Um, <coughs> this was uh, also uh, allied with the Soviet Union, but then um, the head of Yugoslavia, Tito and Stalin, were at loggerheads, uh, and so Yugoslavia was not a client state directly of the Soviet Union, although they largely operated with the Soviet Union, right? So the red area is as far as the Soviet forces got with the conclusion of World War II, and that's where they stopped. The blue area is where the United States and the British and the French were, uh, and that's where they stopped. So as you can see, um, if you look closely here, you have East Germany and West Germany. This was part of the greater German state, which was uh, as a result of conferences during the war for planning what you're going to do afterwards is about creating a shared occupation, right? So the defeated German state is going to be occupied by the United States, the French, and the Soviets, um, and they are going to administer this area until the state can be allowed to return as an independent state. Uh, related to that is this one. This uh, occupied uh, uh, state breaking up uh, Germany into Soviet and uh, US, British and French spheres also includes uh, the capital city, Berlin. And Berlin is deep inside um, uh, East Germany. So the city of Berlin is also carved up into four districts which are occupied by the British, the French, the United States, and the Soviets, right? So uh, Berlin itself, here we go, uh, the three, four districts uh, are all deep inside of East Germany, which is right here, right? So this is West Germany, this is East Germany, and that's where the capital Berlin is. So. Um, the Soviets captured Berlin, bringing a conclusion to the German war effort uh, after Hitler um, committed suicide. Um, and so the occupation of Berlin by Soviet soldiers um, 
resulted in the end of the war and then the capital city itself was jointly occupied. Uh, and that continued after the war. Okay, uh, so the United States had this vision of collective security. Um, the Soviets have a different view. Uh, there were a series of meetings of which you caught a glimpse of them uh, in the Victory in the Pacific film, where you had uh, what were called the big three, which would be Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin, who had a series of meetings where they began to talk about um, what the post-war world was going to look like. This was occurring during the war. Um, there was a meeting at Yalta. That was the last meeting that Franklin Delano Roosevelt attended because he died between Yalta and uh, the meeting at Potsdam. Potsdam is also the meeting that uh, you see in the Victory in the Pacific film. Uh, that's when Harry S. Truman uh, attends this meeting. Again, the big three, only now because Franklin Delano Roosevelt has died, his vice president Harry S. Truman has taken over. Uh, and so he was doing the negotiating. So, this negotiation is about making plans. Uh, and at Yalta, Joseph Stalin had made a series of agreements with uh, Churchill and Roosevelt, promising the Soviets would do certain things after the war. And the British and the United States also made promises. Well, in this post-war period, uh, the Soviets were not keeping their promises. One of the promises were that Soviet troops would remove from occupied uh, states and allow those governments to have free and fair elections. That was not happening. So the United States at first was puzzled. What was going on? Why, why were the Soviets not honoring their agreements? Uh, and so there were tensions between these, prior to the uh, conclusion of the war, two allies, the United States and the Soviet Union were allied in destroying uh, Nazi Germany and then um, the Soviets had declared war against the Japanese to, uh, in the waning days of the war in the Pacific as well. So these two allies um, were now beginning to uh, be on opposite sides. And the United States was struggling to understand why this was the case. And the solution came uh, from a uh, message sent by a diplomat by the name of George F. Kennan. Kennan uh, wrote a famous uh, message known as the Long Telegram because it was a long telegram sent from the embassy in Moscow uh, to the Truman administration uh, in which he laid out the explanation for what the Soviets were doing and why uh, and a point he further elaborated in what's known as the Mr. X article. Mr. X article was an anonymous article written in Foreign Affairs that laid out um, this vision of explaining Soviet's behavior. <clears throat> In effect, here's what Kennan said. He said, the Soviets are acting the way they're acting because they're Russians, that they are part of a long running Russian tradition of empire expansion. So it may be Russians in a new garb, a communist garb of uh, a different organizing idea, but they are the reflection of long running Soviet empire building dreams. So what this means is the Soviets are interested in expansion, expansion at the expense of their neighbors. Um, they will not honor any agreements. They will not uh, keep their word on international treaties because their overriding goal is to expand the Russian state, in this case, the Soviet state. So Kennan said, this Soviet state in particular, although Russian in general, is a very sick state. It is a system that relies upon oppression and terror to maintain itself in power. That this system of oppression and terror uh, will ultimately fail unless it can continue to expand and acquire new resources. So Kennan said what the United States policy, policies should be, should be to contain Soviet expansion, expansion. Because Kennan said, the seeds of the destruction of the Soviet state lay within. 
He said the whole apparatus is rotten, and if we prevent it from expanding, it will collapse of its own rotten weight. Uh, this was a uh, remarkably audacious description. And it became the foundation of the American policy, although as we shall see, it undergoes changes uh, throughout the entire Cold War. And in fact, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, a, uh, an intrepid newspaper reporter looked up George Kennan and discovered, probably to his uh, surprise, that Kennan was still alive. And so he phoned them up and said, in effect, so what do you think? You were right. You know, isn't this amazing? Uh, and uh, Kennan said, um, if I had known that it would take this long, I never would have recommended this as a policy for the United States to adopt because I didn't think the United States public had uh, the ability or endurance to uh, pursue this policy for so long. Not the feel-good story the, the reporter was looking for, uh, but right in character with Kennan. Right? So his containment policy, uh, it, it was stopping Soviet expansion. It was not about rolling back the Soviet. And so when you think about the map, which I also will post on Blackboard, that you saw, um, the Soviet Union occupied a lot of independent states on their drive to Germany, and now they were in the Soviet sphere of influence. They were under Soviet control, one of which was Poland. And as you recall, uh, guaranteeing Poland's borders was why the British and the French declared war uh, against the Germans in World War II. Now they were occupied by the Soviets and they were prevented from having an independent government. This is uh, um, a, uh, a bitter fact for the Poles who said, we were invaded by both the Germans and the Russians. Uh, we've now uh, successfully won the war with the Russians as the allies of our guarantors, the British and the French, and we still don't have our own country. So, um, Kennan said, we can't try to roll back the Soviets for the following reason. The only thing the Soviet populace, the Russian populace, hates more than their own government is foreign invaders. So if the United States tries to roll back uh, the Soviet uh, expansion, the Soviet state will be able to say our outside enemies are threatening us again, and the Soviet people would rally around the government. So he said, you can't try to um, directly influence what's going on in the Soviet Union in that sense. You just have to prevent them. And he said, further, his idea of containment was not contain the Soviets everywhere. His idea of containment was pick a few key spots that you cannot allow the Soviets to have, and that's where you draw your line in the sand. And he says, the Soviets will only respond to force. So um, you can't make deals, you can't negotiate, you have to meet their expansion with a countervailing force and be prepared to use it in order to prevent Soviet uh, expansion, to contain them, right? So <coughs> Kennan's theory or proposal became the founding um, approach for the United States government uh, in this post-war period. Um, this approach of containment relied upon allies to help the Soviets, uh, pr or, or help prevent Soviet expansion, and also to ensure that the Soviets didn't gobble up these territories voluntarily, that they didn't choose to join the Soviet side. And in the post-war period, um, the United States increasingly recognized that their allies of Western Europe, the British, the French, and other states, West Germany now, under the, the control of uh, the British, French, the United States and joint occupation, um, these places were in desperate circumstances. And states that are in desperate circumstances are amenable to radical solutions, radical solutions like communist revolutions perhaps. So the United States, um, as part of this containment policy said, we gotta help these states recover. Uh, and that help came in the form of something known as the Marshall Plan. We saw George Marshall, uh, he was part of the discussion on victory in the Pacific about invading Japan. He then became Secretary of State. Uh, apparently, he was a very poor speaker, 
Um, and he gave a speech at Harvard that laid out these ideas of the Marshall Plan, but almost no one heard him because he kind of mumbled uh, and talked uh, down to his paper. Uh, but nonetheless, he laid out this vision known as the Marshall Plan. This is a massive aid package to the defeated states first of Europe, later extended to the Japanese as well, to help them rebuild and recover. Now, this Marshall Plan has many elements to it, some of which are altruistic. Um, these states are in desperate circumstances. The United States is in good, uh, tremendously good financial health and shape. Um, reaching out and helping these uh, people in their desperate circumstances is part of it, but not by any means all of it. This is a foreign policy plan. Uh, and it's, uh, it's predicated on the idea that rebuilding these states and making them healthy will make them resistant to radical action like revolution, and they will serve as allies in preventing Soviet expansion, communist expansion as they refer to it. Um, what it entailed was a massive giveaway of money from the United States to these places. By 1951, $12 billion had been given uh, away in the Marshall Plan, $12 billion in 1951 money, which is a lot of money. Uh, is given away to help these states recover. And it's given to these states with only two strengths. One, the money to be used is to rebuild the infrastructure of the state, which includes um, highways, railways, uh, bridges, also includes factories, right? So rebuilding the physical infrastructure to rebuild the economic sector so they can get back to work. So you can't take the money and build a grand new palace for you know, whatever pol political leader. It has to be spent on something that will improve uh, the infrastructure or the economy of the nation. Two, uh, you got to let us see what you're spending on. So this was designed to prevent um, people siphoning off the money for their pockets. You had to be able to justify what the money went to. But that was it. Those were the only strings attached. Um, this idea was so enticing, and uh, the United States, perhaps mistakenly, had made it open-ended, that at first the communist states were excited about this idea too. Uh, and this idea really caught um, Joseph Stalin flat-footed. He didn't anticipate this sort of uh, idea of a free giveaway of money. Uh, and so uh, some of the communist states uh, showed up at the uh, at the first great conference to discuss how this money will be uh, given uh, because Joseph Stalin hadn't issued a clear directive on it uh, and um, they really wanted the money. Uh, so this was actually somewhat embarrassing for American diplomats because they were kind of in a pickle. How are we going to give these states behind the uh, Soviet uh, uh, wall? Uh, how are we going to give them uh, money or how we're going to prevent giving them money when we have it, you know, we said we're going to help, this is altruistic to help people recover. Uh, but then Joseph Stalin made it clear to some of the states who showed up, I believe the Czechoslovakian government had showed up, that they were free to take the money, but then Joseph Stalin wouldn't be happy. And these folks understood that when Joseph Stalin's not happy, bad things happen to the people who make those decisions. So uh, they uh, stormed out of the conference in a great big huff and didn't get any of the money. So the United States distributed his money and they were remarkably successful. So successful, in fact, that by the 1970s, the rebuild industries, particularly in the steel sector, that Marshall uh, Plan money had paid for, began to outcompete the United States, which decimated American steel production. So the Germans and the Japanese had brand new steel factories and were producing superior steel uh, than the United States, which caused quite a bit of economic uh, distress uh, to the industrial sector of the United States in the 1970s. So this is, um, it's, it's a multifaceted effort. And I don't wanna under, uh, I don't wanna ignore the fact that there is some altruistic component. The other uh, component related to this as well, in addition to the foreign policy concerns is, all these states were flat broke and they all need stuff and they can't make stuff on their own. But there's a place that has a lot of stuff they can make and sell, but these people don't have any money to do so. That place was the United States. So this is also a way of helping uh, the econ economic structure of the United States because 
This will help build overseas markets for all those goods because they're going to need lots of steel, they're gonna need lots of cement, all these people are gonna need shoes or hats or whatever. Uh, and who can make all this stuff and sell it in great volume? Why the United States? So there's many elements to this Marshall Plan, but the, it's fundamentally about rebuilding these states because this will be this is seen as being in the best interests of the United States. As I said, the Soviets were caught somewhat flat-footed by this. Uh, and so the Soviet, uh, Joseph Stalin's response, um, he responded uh, in a, a surprising way. Uh, as we have seen, Berlin is located far inside East Germany, which is part of the Soviet occupied sector. And Joseph Stalin uh, was wanting uh, the United States, the British and the French out of his side of uh, this uh, uh, Soviet sector and wanted them out of the capital of Berlin but the United States was not willing to go. Uh, so he decided to put pressure on them. It's known as the Berlin blockade, in which uh, without warning, uh, Joseph Stalin cut off access to West Berlin. Uh, he also cut off the power to West Berlin. So all the poor West Berliners were uh, stuck uh, deep inside um, East Germany, uh, occupied by the Soviets, and they were cut off from the outside world. Uh, the rail lines and the roads were all blockaded, but they didn't blockade the air corridors. And so the United States and allies responded in the following fashion. They began to fly in uh, supplies to the people in West Berlin. So they flew in um, clothing, food, medicine, diapers, um, fuel, everything that uh, the West Berliners could not supply on their own. United States and the Allies flew these planes in delivering this material. Uh, Stalin was not willing to uh, risk war to shoot down these planes, uh, so the Berlin Airlift, as it became known, ran for over a year before Stalin finally gave it up and reopened the roads and the highways. This uh, was a um, grand miscalculation by Joseph Stalin. Uh, it wasn't, he didn't anticipate uh, what the United States would do. Uh, and you have to see this again in the, in the framework of a competition. Um, the Soviets are um, competing in this arena, not just in Berlin, but around the world for support for their system. And here they are, in effect, trying to starve West Berlin into submission. It's not very good public relations, right? Uh, so this conflict um, through the 1940s into uh, the late 1940s has solidified into a conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, and it's a conflict of ideology, of uh, military might, uh, of economics, of cultural identity, right? So it, it's a conflict between two different ways of seeing the world. In retrospect, we can look back and see the United States was in a much greater superior position. Right, the Soviets were absolutely devastated from, from the war, and they had little ability to compete with the United States in any venue except the military. And to, to no uh, small measure of the power of the United States military after the war, the United States had the bomb, and nobody else did. Um, in retrospect, we can see that if we're thinking in terms of the chips, the United States has far more chips than the Soviets have in this uh, global uh, poker game. Uh, but um, that was not so readily apparent at the time. Uh, and two events occurred in the late 1940s, in 1949 to be specific, uh, that signaled um, a lot of fear to other states. The first was uh, the surprise detona detonation of a Soviet atomic bomb in August 1949. This was a shock uh, to uh, the American um, uh, intelligence world, military world, and the diplomatic world of the Truman administration. They were not anticipating, they did not expect the Soviets would be able to detonate a bomb so quickly. Uh, and then when that was uh, announced to the American public in September, it provoked great fear. Now the Soviets have the bomb too, uh, and also a lot of suspicion. How did they get it so quick? 
because the predecessors of the CIA had uh, anticipated that the United States would have a monopoly on the bomb for about 10 years. Uh, and here we are uh, four years after, a little more than four years after the United States detonated the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, and now the Soviets have it. Um, they began to look for uh, spies. How did the Soviets get this information? There must have been spies. There were some spies uh, in the Manhattan Project, the project to develop uh, the nuclear bomb. Uh, and as we have seen uh, by going through the archives uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, that these spies were helpful. But they're not the primary reason that the Soviets got the bomb. The Soviets got the bomb because they have good physicists too. Uh, and here's a little uh, secret for you. Um, any good physics graduate student can construct an atomic bomb in theory. The difficulty comes in acquiring the, the material, uh, the fissile material that can explode, uh, and uh, also in the very precise engineering that must be done in order to make the bomb operate. Uh, so um, there's also something uh, uh, from uh, technology studies that says um, even without having the information uh, about how something is done. Knowing that something can be done makes it easier for other people to achieve that breakthrough as well. So when the, when the United States detonated the bomb, the Soviet physicists understood what they had uh, achieved and they knew that it was possible to do so, so they were able to develop their own approaches to the bomb. They were aided along the way by information from the Soviet or from Soviet spies uh, who were delivering how the United States had gone about doing this. So this provoked great fear and set off a search in the United States, who are these spies that are undermining the nation? Shortly after the detonation of the Soviet bomb, another surprising event occurred. This was a surprise to the American public. It was not a surprise to the Truman administration. The surprise was that the communists uh, had successfully overthrown the government in China. This was something that the Truman administration had known was going to occur. The uh, Chinese nationalist government, as they were uh, termed, uh, headed by Chiang Kai-shek, was an immensely corrupt government that was uh, deeply hated in the countryside. Um, the uh, Chinese uh, population was largely a rural population. Most of the people lived in the countryside in very poor economic status as um, uh, small uh, or tenant farmers. So um, that corrupt government uh, held no appeal to them and the communist revolution, the insurgents um, under Mao Zedong had actively worked uh, with the uh, rural population to generate support for this <clears throat> effort. So the Truman administration understood for a while that it was inevitable that the Chinese communists would win because they were overwhelmingly more popular with the majority of the, uh, of the public. And no amount of money and aid that the United States sent would prevent this from occurring. Uh, this did not prevent Congress from sending enormous amounts of money and aid to prop up the nationalist government. So in October, when uh, the, uh, when Mao led the march into uh, what becomes Beijing, then known as Peking, uh, they took uh, over the government and the Chinese nationalist government fled to the island uh, of Formosa, now known as the island or the country of Taiwan, right? So this revolution um, was a communist revolution, which came as a double shock to the American public. So now you have between the Soviets and the Chinese um, you have more than a quarter of the globe's population are uh, part of the communist world. And the success of the Chinese revolution was seen as a function of um, the Soviet communist effort. So this merited two responses. One, at home, it merited this search for the spies, which uh, centered around um, a, a politician from Wisconsin by the name of Joseph McCarthy. McCarthy and the resulting movement is known as McCarthyism. Uh, and so um, McCarthy uh, 
asserted that there were, the United States State Department was full of communist spies who were working for communist governments to overthrow the government. It was a baseless charge. Um, he um, magically, he pulled out a sheaf of papers at a speech and said, I have on here a list of 114 known members of the Communist Party who are in the State Department as I speak. Um, and then um, after a while, that report came out and then it start, set off a firestorm of people um, wanting to know more about these communists that McCarthy was supposedly knew about uh, and this search to find them. Uh, the problem was McCarthy kept making up new numbers every time he gave a speech and nobody ever got to see the names he had on uh, his sheet of paper because he was making them up. This was a, an attempt to gain some political support because Joseph McCarthy was coming up for re-election as a senator. Uh, he had recently been rated the worst senator in the Senate by his peers. Uh, so um, he, his uh, re-election chances did not look very promising. So uh, he was searching around for a topic he thought might generate some support. And so searching for communists um, was something that he floated as an idea and he was surprised at how rapidly it took off. Uh, so this McCarthyism was this desperate search for communist infiltration in all of American life. Uh, and there were trials and hearings and smearings and uh, bannings and all these things revolving around this idea that communism is bad and evil. And anybody who went to a meeting or read um, a worker's daily or something um, was tainted. So at home, it took this sort of paranoid um, witch hunt for people uh, with supposed link to ra uh, the radical communist ideology. Abroad, um, this took the form of US involvement in the Korean War. Um, so this needs a little backstory. The United States, um, as a result of what they saw uh, as um, Chamberlain's capitulation at Munich, uh, and as the, the result of a series of missteps that allowed fascist states to gain more power, the United States' uh, diplomatic view was that uh, fascist or dictators who are seeking to expand need to be stopped at the outset because as they gain more power, it'll be more difficult. So this thinking is part uh, of the American diplomatic uh, view of the world. Also, uh, there was this view that uh, the communists were acting as a unified bloc and were seeking to expand for global domination. So no activities um, that occurred from a communist state uh, happened without the explicit uh, direction and command by Moscow. Which leads us to the Korean War. So Korea is the peninsula. Uh, that was jointly occupied by the Soviets and the United States at the conclusion of World War II. The United States, uh, Korea was a uh, colony of the Japanese home islands. They stole Korea uh, and turned it into uh, a colony of the Japanese state. So to the conclusion of the war, they're going to create a Korean government. Uh, the Soviets, after entering the war uh, in the last waning days uh, of the Pacific War, um, occupied the northern half of the Korean Peninsula. The United States occupied the southern half because they were going to use that as a staging ground for the invasion of the Japanese home islands. With the conclusion of the war, the state was split in two. The Soviets occupied the northern half, the United States occupied the southern half. The plan was that there was going to be an election to unify the two halves of the peninsula under one government. Um, but um, that uh, vote was marked by, uh, in the North, the government was supported, um, the, the Soviet supported uh, a, an expatriate who was brought back from uh, the Soviet Union and installed into power, um, who was a communist. In the South, the United States favored a, a strongman nationalist um, who was going to be a, a uh, one of the democratic government, or so they asserted. So the United States and the Soviets both agreed that they would um, exit the peninsula. So you had in the North, a government under um, the grandfather 
of uh, the current leader of Korea. Uh, and in the South, you had a um, uh, leader by the name of Sigmund Rhee. And these, uh, the North and South, divided in half, um, had engaged in low-level sporadic conflict back and forth across this border. And um, the uh, grandfather of King Jong-un, uh, Kim Il-sung, um, was um, continually um, pressuring Joseph Stalin to allow him to invade the South and to turn it into one communist government. And Joseph Stalin held him off. But with the uh, successful uh, communist revolution in China, um, China began to reach out to the uh, communist leadership of North Korea. And so Stalin was somewhat um, threatened uh, by this idea that the Chinese were beginning to assert some sort of independence uh, in thinking in terms of communist revolution. So he gave his support um, to the North Korean government who invaded the South Korean government without warning. And they drove the South Korean forces down the peninsula, uh, down to a tiny corner of uh, surrounding the port of Pusan, which uh, when the, the North Korean forces overran the border and began to invade South Korea, the United States immediately responded by saying, we need to stop communist expansion. So they went and got, uh, um, authorization from the United Nations uh, to engage in protecting uh, South Korea, and they uh, rushed over soldiers from uh, the Japanese occupation to the Korean Peninsula, where now the United States was involved in the war. Um, United States, um, uh, under Douglas MacArthur, had a, a daring raid uh, behind um, the North Korean lines by uh, landing at Incheon, and um, the United States broke out of the Pusan Peninsula and began to drive the North Korean forces back. And they drove them to the border between North and South Korea, but they didn't stop. They continued to drive the North Koreans back up the Korean Peninsula, occupying what was formerly North Korea. And as the uh, Koreans were being driven back to their border with China, at the uh, border marked by the Yalu River, um, the Chinese began to signal that they would not allow the, the North Korean forces to be uh, completely defeated. And so the Chinese sent 800,000 volunteers uh, across the river and it changed the war and they drove the United States and the United Nations forces back down the peninsula and they drove them below um, the line between North and South Korea, where then over the next couple of years, the United States um, drove uh, at great cost, drove the Chinese back uh, to where roughly they were before um, the whole start of the conflict. Uh, and so then it settled into this war of stalemate. Uh, a stalemate broken by the election of Dwight David Eisenhower and the death of Joseph Stalin, for that matter. But Eisenhower let it be known that he was seeking an end to this uh, conflict uh, and was uh, willing to use nuclear weapons. And so um, the negotiations, which had been dragging on for uh, over a year and a half, uh, began to have some breakthroughs. And eventually, they reached an armistice that uh, split the Korean Peninsula at precisely where it had been split before. There's a North Korean government now. Uh, Kim Il Sung's, um, uh, or uh, excuse me, Kim Jong, um, his uh, uh, son Kim Il Sung uh, ruled, and then when he died, um, Kim Jong Un, uh, who is the current leader of North Korea, took over. So uh, this Korean dynasty of uh, communist uh, dictatorship has extended since the conclusion of uh, the Korean War. And the Korean War is not, there's no peace treaty, it's uh, a temporary stalemate, which is why the United States forces are still there uh, on the border protecting South Korea from North Korea. So this leads me to the 1950s and the Eisenhower administration. Uh, Eisenhower is elected uh, in 1952. Um, he was president from 1952 to 1960, and he had 
uh, he, he understood as the, um, the great military general who had led the invasion of York um, and uh, his long uh, experience uh, in the military, he understood uh, this nature of the expenses of warfare. He also understood uh, nuclear weapons. And there's been bit, a bit of a renaissance amongst historians studying uh, Eisenhower uh, and coming to recognize that Eisenhower's um, status and, and use of American power during his years in diplomatic terms um, was much more effective than uh, we recognized. Uh, one of the things that <clears throat> Eisenhower recognized is that nuclear weapons are um, an entity that no, they do, do not have a strategic, or they don't have a, a tactical application. They're simply too powerful to be used. So their power, particularly in the development of hydrogen bombs, which are uh, uh, many orders more powerful than uh, the atomic bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, the um, atomic bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki are measured in the thousands of tons, right? So they're kilotons. The hydrogen bombs are significantly more powerful. Their power is measured in the millions of tons of dynamite. Uh, so these nuclear weapons are so powerful that they can't be used because they would destroy everything uh, that you are that you would drop them on. So the the idea of the war of a war is to defeat your enemy and to have the territory um, that can be used in some fashion. Well, the, the hydrogen bomb would destroy the territory, and not only their territory where you drop the bombs on, they're likely to destroy big swaths of our territory as well. So as a military weapon, they have no use because they're far too powerful. Their use comes in the form of psychological weapons, and it's another component of this conflict known as the Cold War. Um, the Soviet Union was going to build hydrogen bombs, so the United States had to build hydrogen bombs. And as we build hydrogen bombs, the Soviets build hydrogen bombs. And so um, this uh, arms race is a function of the Cold War as part of this conflict. Um, you would look weaker if you didn't have these atomic bombs. But something that Eisenhower understood that uh, we've come to appreciate since is that the United States had a preponderance of these deliverable nuclear weapons, a far greater amount. Uh, and these weapons allowed Eisenhower to engage in a diplomatic practice known as brinksmanship, which was to use the implicit threat of deploying these weapons uh, as a way to achieve your diplomatic goals. That the, uh, you know, don't push me too far or I'll use these uh, weapons. Eisenhower was able to do so because the United States had a lot of these deliverable weapons. Uh, and they suspected that the Soviets did not. Now, the, um, the death of Joseph Stalin uh, he died of a heart attack and it, or a stroke, and it appears that he laid on his floor uh, for several hours before he died. Nobody came in to check on Stalin because they were so terrified of Joseph Stalin. So when he didn't get up when he normally did, nobody would go to the door and check on him uh, because they were afraid of disturbing Stalin. Uh, so it appears that he lingered on the floor for a while before he died, and who knows if medical care would have helped him, but it doesn't matter, right? So. In the Soviet system, when there is a change in leadership, this is a very fraught period because this dictatorship does not have a clear chain of secession. In the United States, we have elections every four years for the uh, chief executive. No such things occur in the Soviet Union or no such real things occur. So after Stalin's death, there was a period of time when there was a struggle uh, in which three people led the government known as the Trioka. And one of these people eventually uh, gained, gained enough control to force out the other two. His name is Nikita Khrushchev. Nikita Khrushchev um, is uh, an enormously interesting fellow. Uh, and Khrushchev understood that the Soviet Union was in desperate circumstances. Uh, and he also understood that you know, the United States, um, it was more powerful in most measures than the Soviet Union. But 
Khrushchev didn't want to let anybody else know that because if it was apparent that the Soviets were weaker, then that competition to gain allies or to hold on to allies would be something that people would leave and go to the other side. So Khrushchev engaged in a lot of blustering and he was able to do so because of the effectiveness of Soviet uh, spying efforts in that they had infiltrated a lot of the agencies that were um, responsible for intelligence gathering in the Soviet Union and he compromised them. Most uh, famously, they were known as the Cambridge Five uh, in British intelligence, uh, in which uh, the most important member of these Cambridge Five was a man by the name of Kim Philby, whose job at, in the British intelligence service was to serve as the liaison with the CIA. Uh, and he informed uh, the Soviets of every uh, spy or whatever who was uh, um, being sent by the CIA. So the CIA had very little human uh, intelligence from the Soviet Union. Uh, and so Khrushchev uh, was asserting that the Soviet Union and the superior Soviet system uh, was recovering so well that, as he said, we will soon overtake uh, the United States in our ability to produce stuff. And he said, and then we will, as we go by, wave bye-bye to the United States because we will soon be surpassing them. He goes, and then after we wave bye-bye, we will turn around as good citizens and say, let us help you. Uh, and he was asserting that Soviet uh, recovery, industrial recovery, he also asserted that the uh, Soviet Union was creating a new technology uh, known uh, as uh, missiles. And as he said, we were turning out missiles like sausages. So all these things are about uh, suggesting the Soviets are recovering and becoming more powerful, which was seen as a threat to the United States. Um, Eisenhower suspected this was not true, and then he had a technology that confirmed that. The technology is known as the U-2. Uh, it was a plane that flew so high and so fast um, that it could overfly the Soviet Union and take pictures. This, by the way, is a uh, violation of international airspace, which would be recognized as a declaration of war. So neither the Soviets nor the United States um, would state publicly that the United States was flying planes over uh, Soviet territory. The Soviets, because they were embarrassed that they were unable to protect their airspace and shoot down uh, these aircraft, the United States, because doing so would reveal that um, they uh, were violating Soviet airspace, a, a uh, international declaration of war uh, activity. What these aircraft did uh, was they flew over top and they took uh, remarkably uh, precise photos. Um, reportedly, the cameras were so precise that flying at 30,000, 40,000 feet uh, above the ground, uh, the aircraft could take a picture in which the analyst could read the headline of a newspaper that someone was holding. So as the United States flew over the Soviet Union taking lots and lots of pictures, they were looking for these missile places um, that uh, supposedly uh, Khrushchev was saying were all over the place and uh, these fleets of long distance bombers that could carry nuclear weapons. So at first the United States analysts were puzzled because they thought uh, the Soviets were hiding it so well that they couldn't find anything. They could only find six missile uh, bases or six missile sites in which the, the missiles would take 24 hours in order to get onto the site uh, on the launch pad and operable. So as they're pouring over these photographs looking for all this information, they suddenly realize Khrushchev was bluffing. Now the United States knew for sure that Khrushchev was bluffing uh, and that the United States held an enormous superiority in the ability to deliver nuclear weapons. Um, this knowledge uh, was something that Khrushchev came to find out because much to um, uh, the surprise of Eisenhower, probably one of the last flights they were flying over the Soviet Union in the U-2 because they were developing a new technology of satellite observation. Um, one of the last flights was one um, that disappeared off the radar screen. Um, Eisenhower had been assured by CIA officials that one, planes flying that high, uh, no pilot could survive uh, a fall from that height. 
Uh, two, when the plane broke up at that altitude, everything would break apart so drastically that there would be little intelligence that uh, the Soviets would get from it. Three, even if by some way the pilot survived this terrible crack up at 40,000 feet and plummet to the earth, he had been given a cyanide pill he was supposed to eat instead of being captured. So uh, with that information, uh, Eisenhower announced um, that the United States had lost a, a, a meteorological plane that was flying along the edges of Soviet airspace. The Soviets had announced that they had recovered a spy plane. So Eisenhower was trying to brazen it out by saying this was not the case. And then Khrushchev unveiled, unveiled uh, the wreckage of the plane uh, and unveiled the captured pilot, a man by the name of Gary Powers. This was enormously uh, embarrassing to the United States. Eisenhower had been caught in a big lie uh, and was forced to admit that the United States had been flying planes over Soviet airspace. This was alarming to Khrushchev as well because his technicians were able to uh, uh, recover the film from the camera and he saw precisely how detailed these pictures were. So he knew that the United States was um, fully aware of the limitations of Soviet military production in bombers and missiles. Um, this probably played some sort of role, it's still not clear because we can't really understand exactly what Nikita Khrushchev was thinking uh, in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, Khrushchev believed he could bully the new young president, a president by the name of John F. Kennedy, uh, and so uh, he was uh, bullying uh, him on the issues of Berlin. And Kennedy knew in the job and also embarrassed uh, politically because of the Bay of Pigs fiasco early in his uh, tenure as president, uh, was stuck in a bad place. Uh, but uh, Kennedy uh, said, I, I gotta stop letting Khrushchev push me around. Uh, and so he said to Khrushchev, in discussions that one thing the United States would not abide would be any nuclear weapons in the Western Hemisphere. And Khrushchev agree, agreed. He said, we would never introduce nuclear weapons, which is why it's so puzzling that Khrushchev put nuclear weapons in Cuba. Um, to some degree, it's because the, as Khrushchev was later to remark in some context, um, that he wanted the Americans to feel how it felt to have nuclear weapons pointing at your uh, neck all the time because the United States was able to deliver nuclear weapons in great volume on the Soviet Union, but they could not do the same. So they uh, secretly installed um, uh, intermediate range nuclear missiles uh, that could reach all the way across the continental United States as far as Seattle. So everything's in range of these new nuclear missiles. Um, and he tried to sneak them in secretly, but a U-2 overflight of Cuba discovered these missiles uh, in the process of being set up. And it set off this tremendous um, uh, tension-filled uh, moment between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, the United States said the Soviets would have to remove them. And so uh, this, this tension was ratcheting up. Uh, and we know quite a bit about what the United States was plotting because uh, uh, John F. Kennedy had uh, uh, created a small ad hoc group known as the Executive Committee, and they were meeting to discuss what the United States was going to do. And then he also bugged the room, uh, so we heard what the people said when Kennedy was not in the room. Uh, and the upshot was the military official said, bomb them. Let's uh, bomb these sites, we gotta do it right away, and then we should yeah, invade yeah. Cuba, right? Uh, and so uh, that's one set of advice that Kennedy was getting. Um, in fact, Kennedy and his uh, attorney general, who happened to be his brother, Robert Kennedy, were the only two that were uh, counseling, let's try a different option, right? Uh, so um, Kennedy um, announced that this would be a um, unacceptable uh, event to have these nuclear missiles in Cuba, and also to convince the world, release the photos that the U-2 had taken at the United Nations, uh, demonstrating that this was not a false assertion. And Khrushchev uh, was in a bind, right? So uh, Kennedy, borrowing some of the language of Franklin Delano Roosevelt borrowed, said that he was going to quarantine the island of Cuba and prevent any more uh, 
ships arriving with munitions to Cuba until those missiles were removed. Now, quarantine sounds uh, very serious, um, but uh, it is serious because it's actually a naval blockade. But if you use the word naval blockade in diplomatic speak, that's also a declaration of war. So he avoided the term, but he's blockading Cuba. Meanwhile, on the high seas were some Soviet freighters who had some large crates on board that looked just like nuclear missiles were being delivered to Cuba. So the tension was coming up uh, very high. The United States Navy was patrolling um, uh, around Cuba, uh, stop, planning on stopping any ships. Meanwhile, there's a Soviet, couple of Soviet freighters who are approaching this line, this quarantine line, and the tensions were dramatically high. Uh, and then a, a message came to uh, the uh, Kennedy, and it was uh, reportedly from Khrushchev, and in effect it said, you know, we're going to stand down, right? Uh, okay, so this was seen as good news. And then shortly thereafter, another message came, uh, also reportedly from Khrushchev, saying, uh, stop me if you dare, right? So here we had two set of different messages, both of them reportedly sent from Nikita Khrushchev, one agreeing that we should negotiate an end to this, the other one suggesting um, that, you know, we're not stopping, what are you gonna do about it? Um, and then uh, Robert Kennedy came up with a suggestion. Um, he said, uh, why don't we pretend we didn't get that second message and reply to the first message over the radio uh, that we agreed to discuss this with Khrushchev, which is precisely what John F. Kennedy did. Uh, meanwhile, uh, as the ships approached the line, they turned around at the last minute so they didn't try and run the blockade. So it looked like tensions were easy. Uh, and then uh, a U.S. U-2 or a U.S. Air, it wasn't a U-2, it was a U.S. plane that was overflying Cuba, a reconnaissance plane was shot down by Cuban uh, aircraft, so, um, or uh, anti-aircraft. So uh, again, tensions ratcheted up. Uh, at the last minute, Nikita Khrushchev announced uh, that he would be willing to negotiate with the United States to remove the missiles from Cuba. Um, we now know, um, and have known actually for quite a long time, that the United States had made a deal, that it wasn't just the Soviets said we're going to remove them. The deal was the United States was going to remove some uh, missiles from Turkey. And the United States also pledged, John F. Kennedy pledged, they would not seek to invade Cuba and overthrow the government, which of course had been the, uh, the United States support for the Bay of Pigs invasion was to overthrow the government. Uh, this agreement, um, was on the, the secret side, uh, so it was not readily known at the time. Uh, what was readily known is that the Soviets removed the missiles and were forced to bring them back. It was uh, a humiliation for the Soviet Union. Uh, it was a humiliation um, that led to a couple of different outcomes, outcome number one. Um, this humiliation uh, weakened Khrushchev at home, so eventually uh, in the next couple of years he was removed from power. Right, so it undercut him um, at home because the, the Soviet Union was embarrassed. What they were embarrassed about was that the United States was threatening to destroy the Soviet Union in response to the use of nuclear weapons from Cuba, and the Soviets couldn't do anything about it. They didn't have the ability. They didn't have missiles like sausages or long-range bombers. So in the aftermath of this humiliation, the Soviets doubled and redoubled their effort to construct more deliverable nuclear weapons, especially intercontinental ballistic missiles, which are missiles to deliver, to deliver nuclear weapons from Moscow on the United States. So that was outcome uh, from that. Uh, two, uh, there was a recognition that um, we should be able to talk to one another. You know, the confusion of conflicting messages coming uh, led to the creation of uh, the Red Telephone, which is a direct line between the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, so that if there were ever issues that required a, a rapid discussion between the two leaders, they could do so. Uh, third was the crafting of a policy known as MAD. MAD stands for Mutually Assured Destruction. And the idea is that if I believe you can destroy my country, and you believe I will destroy your country, 
well, there's no incentive for either one of us to destroy the other's country. So instead of threatening to destroy each other's country, we can negotiate on some issue, right? Because in effect, if you have a gun to my head and I have a gun to your head, then we can talk about other things that we can agree on, right? Because uh, neither one of us wants to take a bullet to the head. Uh, so uh, mutually assured destruction says, instead of trying to create anti-ballistic missiles and protect um, the infrastructure uh, of delivering nuclear weapons, that we should leave it open so that you can be assured that if uh, you attack me and destroy my cities, I will be able to attack you and destroy your city. Um, instead of hoping that I can protect my cities and then attack you in a first strike and then hope my defense works, instead if we leave each other vulnerable to these nuclear weapons, then neither side will use them. That is the logic of the mad uh, doctor. A small footnote to this uh, Cuban Missile account. Uh, we were very close in the Cuban Missile uh, crisis to uh, launching nuclear weapons. The United States policy, if, uh, the, if, the, if the Soviets had launched missiles from Cuba, the United States policy was to launch every nuclear missile they had on the Soviet Union and its allies. So uh, massive retaliation, as is referred to, was the only plan the United States had. There was no Let's move, you know, let's negotiate after um, Cuba uh, vaporizes Washington, D.C. The idea is Cuba will be vaporized, Moscow will be vaporized, China will be vaporized, uh, Hungary will be vaporized, everybody gets vaporized if that's the case. So uh, that response was if any nuclear missiles were fired from Cuba, the United States would destroy the Soviet Union. Um, and of course, the Soviets would try and destroy whatever they could of the United States in the same way. Uh, so that was the United States policy. Um, so in, uh, with the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was a conference held in Havana, which brought together um, diplomats and advisors from the uh, former Soviet government, from the United States, and from Cuba. And they all met at this conference to talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And at this conference, it was revealed that things were even closer than we had anticipated. Um, the um, the uh, Cubans, uh, or so the, the people in Moscow said, well, you know, things were pretty tight, but we had a pretty firm grasp on the nuclear missiles. They would have not have launched without an order from Moscow. Well, then one of the generals, um, who, one of the Russian generals who was in Cuba said, uh, that's not quite true. We had um, the ability to launch those missiles from Cuba, and we understood that if we were attacked, we could launch them. Uh, and so um, we had the codes to launch them and could fire them. Uh, if the United States had attacked, as the general had been advising John F. Kennedy, um, we would have launched those missiles immediately. Uh, further, uh, Castro, Fidel Castro, uh, said, I understood I had the authority to launch these weapons. So if the United States attacked or tried to invade Cuba, I was gonna order the launching of these missiles as well. Um, the control over these nuclear missiles was not what um, the Soviet hierarchy had thought, and so we we're a lot closer than we uh, turn out to be. All right, that's the end of a very long uh, lecture one. Uh, next, we'll pick up uh, lecture two on Gaddis. All right, you can start talking.